Cherry Fish. Yeah, she graduated <laughs> from the University of La Laverne with a BS in biology, went on to Cal Poly Pomona, Pomona to earn her MS in biology. She has a teaching credential from San Jose State University. She has certificates in various areas of botany. She has one in field botany. She has one in um, practical horticulture from the Royal Botanic in Edinburgh. Did Very good. It's right? pretty good, Edinburgh. Okay. <laughs> and so, please help me welcome Lynn McGinnis. Wow, you guys, thank you so much. Hopefully, oh, see, <laughs> I knew when we had this little transition that maybe for a moment it would be wonky. Oh, it's working well, Bernadette. I can see my notes. Um, Georgette. Um, anyway, hey, thank you so much for, this is like kind of mind-blowing a little bit to look out and see all of you guys here tonight. And um, I really appreciate you being here. I am going to jump into this pretty quickly. I have a lot to cover and I'm going to try to keep it tight to an hour. I might go over by five minutes. Be patient with me. Um, I lied a little bit about the topic of this talk because honestly, it could be the science of um, breast cancer. It could be the physics, the math. Um, algorithms, it could be the psychology of breast cancer. There's a lot going on that goes into the treatment of this particular disease. Um, for, for the sake of keeping this talk understandable, I have greatly simplified some aspects of the biology so that we all can kind of um, understand it. And that's also for myself. It's very complex. And if, you, if there's anybody here that maybe they know something about this already, if you have any you know, disagreements with some of my interpretations, please let me know because I'm still learning. I don't know if my journey fighting this particular disease is completely over. So I want to know whatever I can about it. Um, so please let me know. All right, so let's get started. Who am I? Like, why am I talking about this? I would kind of rather be doing a talk on plants tonight, but um, I had a little thing happen in June of 22, so we'll talk about that. Um, I'm kind of all these things, botanist, runner, teacher, mom to Fiona and Gwen, wife to Dawn who's right here. Um, I like to garden. I like to do all the stuff. I'm a regular person. Sometimes I like to go shop. Um, I, I am someone whose cells went wrong, and so I'm here to tell my story about that, and hopefully we can learn some biology while we do it. One in four of us will have cancer during our lifetime. One in eight women will have breast cancer in their lifetime. Each year, breast cancer accounts for 30% of all new cancer cases in US women. This is the cancer that we get the most often. This year, an estimated 297, 790,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer are gonna be diagnosed in the United States, along with 55,720 new cases, oh no. I knew this. I have a new pointer, you guys. <laughs> um, I'm going to memorize my buttons. I've been practicing with this. Um, so I'll talk about invasive breast cancer tonight, and I will also talk about um, DCIS um, also, and I'll define that. 85% of breast cancers occur in women with no family history of cancer. So. Sometimes we think, well, my grandma didn't have breast cancer, my mom didn't have it, I should be fine. And that was me. I was like, nobody in my family has breast cancer. Why do I have, why, where did this come from for me? Um, when you learn that a friend or a loved one has breast cancer, don't make assumptions about their treatment or how they got it or their ultimate prognosis. 
we are all diverse and different in this group of patients. Um, breast cancers differ in their shape, their size, their receptors, the various rates of proliferation and treatments depend, are dependent on all of those different variables. So some of you in the room, who's ever seen that particular picture right there, right? This is the cell life cycle. And we teach this in biology. We talk about it in physiology and other classes. And this is what cells normally do. They go through a portion of their life where they grow. They replicate their DNA. They get ready to divide. And then they go through the M phase or mitosis where they separate their genetic material and one new set goes to each of the cells. Um, what happens with cancer is they have these little checkpoints that they break out of and things aren't happening the way they normally happen and so the cell cycle goes out of control. <laughs> these are our cells gone wrong. You don't catch cancer. They're our cells. These were my cells. They went funky. They're muted, they're out of control, they're gluttonous, they have a sweet tooth, they like sugar, um, they're greedy as hell, and they're malig they have malignant behavior. I kind of laughed about that, like that should be like a punk rock band, malignant behavior, if I start one, I'm going, it's going to be that. Um, and cancers are diverse, so we're going to talk about what they're like. Now, if we get to that little phase of mitosis in the cell cycle, and this is one of the things in pathology that they look for, high rates of mitosis, you can see phases of mitosis. So up here we have like prophase, metaphase, kind of late metaphase, some anaphase going on, telophase. You guys remember that from class? Good, I like it. We're here to look at biology. <laughs> All right, so Sarah and I were on a Glasgow train and I get anxious about things like cancer before having cancer. I still get anxious about it. Um, I sometimes didn't like the awareness, like, oh, I have to think about this? Oh, I need to get a mammogram? Um, we were on the Glasgow subway train and um, this was on the wall and I kind of looked at it and I had had like a little bit of a tendon that was like pulling in my armpit that spring and it was on the left side and I was like, I wonder like, oh, I haven't had a mammogram. I'm late because of the pandemic, like everybody was late. And so I was like, yeah, I want to get home. I need to go get that taken care of. So thank you transport for Glasgow. <laughs> Glasgow is my town, everybody knows. Um, so luckily I came home and did a mammogram. We'll talk more about that as we go forward. So who's in an anatomy class? Okay, I need you to come up and, no. <laughs> hey, this is our basic anatomy. I have a model up here. If you want to come up tonight and check it out. Um, <laughs> Right here in the middle, I'm shaking, oh no. <laughs> the nipple is kind of the trunk. Okay, I'm gonna go botany on you guys. Um, the trunk, we have branches that are the ducts. And then those ducts terminate in these lobules. So lobules is where the milk is made. And then it travels through that duct and out the nipple. So that's all important. There's fat around that. There's some material called the stroma. And then coming off of the breast are these lymph nodes up along the collarbone and up to the side, just kind of by your armpit also. Um, and so, you know, we can actually get breast cancers from anywhere from that clavicle down just below our breast. We could have a breast cancer develop. So it's not always in the breast exactly. So we'll refer back to some of this terminology as we go forward. Um, Self-screening, 40% of diagnosed breast cancers are detected by women who feel a lump. 
10 to 15 percent of breast cancers are not detected on a mammogram. So you go get screened. They're not always going to see it. They're not always going to know. A lot of people feel a lump first and then get screened. It's important to go get screened on a regular basis to catch these things early. Um, however, I did not find a lump. My doctors could not palpitate a lump. So mammogram. Okay, this is the part where I want to spend just an hour talking about the development of mammograms and I don't have that kind of time. Please look up Albert Solomon and look up Philip Strax. Albert Solomon was a surgeon in Berlin and he took tumors out of women and he thought early on, hey, Marie Curie's using x-rays. I'm going to start studying these tumors using x-rays and I'm going to cross-reference what I learn inside of these tumors with those x-rays. Thanks, Albert, because this has led to everything we have now for mammograms. He was the first person to identify microcalcifications, um, which is an early sign of breast cancer. Remember I said that there's malignant behavior? Um, part of that is being messy and dirty and leaving your mess behind. That's microcalcifications. They leave calcium salts behind. So we can see those on the mammogram. Now, there's a long time here in between, right? Some 50 years, World War I, World War II totally put Albert off his game. Philip Strax, a doctor in New York City, created a randomized trial of 62,000 women using mammography in 1963. When they compared the screened group with the control group, 40% fewer deaths in that group in the long run. So they knew that mammograms were going to work and they were going to save a lot of lives. Not till 1988 did we start doing routine screenings. And mammograms use low energy x-rays, this is the physics part, um, to visualize breast tissue characteristics. You need to have a radiologist read these because they're kind of difficult to read. They look for masses, they look for, you know, is the, are the uh, borders fuzzy? or are they um, kind of smooth? Wait, I want to go back. The red thing down here. Patients with cancers found early by mammogram screening have the best overall prognosis. So get screened. Don't put it off. And when it's time to do it, do it on a regular basis. So here are my mammograms. These are the pictures of my breasts you get tonight. Um, <laughs> they're the only ones. <laughs> All right, so this one's fun. This is 2008. I had just kind of finished nursing my second child, Gwen, and there's, there's a mess left behind from milk. It's probably what we see on this particular picture. This white thing looks scary, right? I've never seen this film before. The, like a couple weeks ago, I pulled it out. Um, so this was benign. This breast looked just fine, and I was fine. Um, I'm skipping ahead several years, but this is June of 22. That is my focal asymmetry with microcalcifications. That was what was written on the report. I read that on the report and I'm like, what does that mean? Like, wh what do we do with that? Because they said, we'd like you to come back for an ultrasound. We don't, we don't like this. So, okay, fair enough. Um, and then, just so you know, I had surgery. I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes. But this right here, these are clips left behind when they took this sucker out. They put in these little metal clips as markers. You guys can see them over here. That's all clear now. So that was September 2023. I'm doing well. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I am very thankful. Um, so 
All right, back to this focal asymmetry. Um, they said you have to come in and get an ultrasound. Ultrasounds use sound waves to get another visual, another picture of what's going on. And you know they can find things that look round and smooth and they're like, okay, that's probably, that's benign. Sometimes when they see something like mine and they see the round smooth, they kind of think there's a cyst or something and then they're like, oh, okay, go home, you're fine. Or they might want to check it some more, but they might be like, oh, it's probably okay. If they see these black clouds of ominous darkness, they're a little bit worried. Um, mine was normal. <laughs> I was like, what? So my report came back from the ultrasound, and it literally was like, ah, uh, from the ultrasound. Oh, okay, let me go back. This is a chart right here called the BIRADS chart. And the BIRADS chart, I just, my husband wanted me to make a point of letting you guys know, this is not staging in cancer. And sometimes you get your BIRADS number and it might freak somebody out. But what it is, it's a report number on what they're seeing on the mammogram and what they're seeing on the ultrasound. So, um, Literally on my first mammogram, actually I had a BIRAD zero. And I was like, zero, right? No cancer, nothing, everything's good, right? No, zero's not great. Zero means we want you to come back. Okay, I'll come back. And then I went back again, and then they saw nothing on the ultrasound. They wanted to see something that made them go, that's not cancer. They didn't see that, they just saw nothing. And so they came back with number four. I got bumped up and I was like, okay. Like I don't, I like getting the high score on things, but not this high score. Um, so I got suspicious. Tissue diagnosis, we would like a biopsy. I'm gonna come back to the rest of the story in a minute, but I do want to, while we're here looking at mammograms, if you ever get told you have dense breast tissue, pay attention. They didn't tell me what that meant. And I was kind of afraid of the whole breast cancer thing and didn't really look it up, I'll be honest. They were like, oh yeah, by the way, just be on time for your mammogram. You have dense breast tissue. <laughs> well, women with breast ten breast dense breast tissue have a um, increased risk of developing cancer and science doesn't know why. So, um, there's a couple things. It's an increased risk of developing cancer and also on mammograms. So this is less than 25% dense. There's lots of fatty parenchyma tissue in here and we just see this dot of cancer really stand out, right? Density increases and the density is like connective tissue holding all the lobules and ducts in the right place. So now we can, you know, it's a little less visible, a little less visible with density increasing and with extremely dense, can you, there's a cancer there, but it's really tough to see. They really recommend if you have dense breasts to have an MRI early on baseline, even if they're like, oh, your bi BIRAD's okay, to get that MRI and have that kind of for a comparison later on. So remember I had suspicious, so I had to go give some tissue. So I ended up going to UCSF and they looked at my films and they said, yes, you do need a biopsy because this looks suspicious. And um, they put you on this table. So. Your feet are over here. This is my table. This, I, I don't know if I was supposed to be taking photos. I was thinking I wanted to give a talk. <laughs> I was like, nobody's looking. Um, so I was laying here, literally go, doing photosynthesis in my head to literally take my mind off. Literally, I was like following electrons. Like I was like, there's a game to play, Liz. So I'm laying here, breasts hanging down. Um, they numb the area, they use a needle, and um, they go in and they take a core sample, 
And when they take that core sample, they take a little bit of tumor, a little bit of maybe normal tissue, and here's that removed core. That goes to the pathologist, and that's the person who makes lots of microscope slides and really knows their way around histology. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures in a little while because I don't know how they are actually recognizing everything they recognized. Um, so that's what they do. And then we wait. You gave your tissue sample. You got to go home, do regular things, watch some Netflix and hang out, um, whatever it happens to be, and wait. And a wait. It's a wait. So I get a phone call a couple days later. Um, it's, this is Shelly. Shelly is my nurse practitioner who I adore, who coordinated all my care. Thank goodness for Shelly. Um, hey, Liz, the biopsy results are back, and it's cancer. Um, I kind of just sunk to the floor and didn't really think very much. Um, I couldn't really think very well. And I, I thought all these things um, that I'm not probably supposed to say at a MAPS talk. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I literally, at that moment, I go to the worst case scenario. I'm one of those worriers. And I was like, oh, I'm going to die. OK, this is not great. And Don was listening to the phone call. Like, there was some good biology in there that I usually would be excited to hear, and I missed most of it that day. Um, and Shelly said, treatable, curable. She made me repeat it to her on the phone that day. I think she knew I was <laughs> kind of a little dark spot. Um, we'd like you to come in on Monday for an MRI and to meet some surgeons. And I was like, I will be there. So I had the weekend to have all the thoughts that you have. I was actually currently writing a class on climate change with Noah Hughes, and I was like, I have a lecture I've got to write this weekend. It was kind of great. I jumped in that thing. I was like, yes, let's talk about climate change for a little bit. Um, you know, all this goes through your mind. I think the hardest one, um, how was I going to tell my girls? That one was hard. Um, and I was really thinking, like, I'm not done yet. And I was also thinking I wanted my mom, which I was like, I'm a little bit old for like wanting your mom. <laughs> and then I kind of went back to Shelly said, treatable, curable. So I went in on Monday. They got me in the MRI machine. Hey, look, it's that same position as that other machine. <laughs> Breasts through the thing, roll you into the loud MRI machine. It was cool. I got some music. I was like, I want some rock and roll, whatever, something good. Um, you get more detailed imaging. You find out if maybe there's some lymph node involvement. Um, it's now recommended by a Dutch study, which, which I said earlier, is if you have dense breasts, like every four years, do the MRI in that situation. Um, here's my cancer on the MRI. I would like you to know that a radiologist did not make this marking. I was playing with their little cool tools in my chart and able to mark up my own stuff. They actually measured it 10.5. I probably just enjoy the smaller number. Um, that was millimeters. So, yeah. So, oh, I guess this is the other picture you get of the, the girls today. There's my heart. I feel like my heart looks like it's got something wrong. I need. To... <laughs> I was like, I actually the other night had a moment where I was looking at that and I'm like, I, wow. <laughs> anyway, so kind of cool. I don't know if you guys have ever used my chart, but I love it because then I get a little message from Shelly. Hey, good news on your MRI. We're like texting in my chart. Your left breast is completely normal. And so are your lymph nodes, which I liked. And there doesn't seem to be other suspicious areas in your right breast. So this is where we're at. This is good news, right? And we're getting more science. We're getting more 
of the story. So at every step, getting a little bit more, a little bit more. The more you know, the more you understand like what you can, what the po possible things you can do. All right, so let's go back to some biology. Um, no, okay. Types out there. Now, I highlighted invasive ductal carcinoma because that's the one that I had, um, hopefully had. And these two are the most common, the invasive ductal carcinoma and invasive lobular carcinoma. Um, these start in the ducts and these start in the lobules. So let's go back here to this one though really quick. Ductal carcinoma in situ, which I have some of these guys too. I'll show you a picture of them in a minute. Here is a normal duct. Nothing inside the duct, some nice tissue. In ductal carcinoma in situ, there are cells growing inside of that duct and filling up that duct. Their behavior isn't quite as bad yet. So they're kind of growing slow. They're not trying to infiltrate and get through other tissues at this point. Now, invasive ductal carcinoma, and I should say one more thing, is sometimes they refer to this as precancer um, or seeds of cancer, I think is what Susan Love said in her breast book. Um, it's still, they're gonna treat it like it's cancer in the treatment plan for sure. So invasive carcinoma is growing out of the duct into the stroma, into the space outside of the duct. Invasive lobular carcinoma is growing outside of the lobule. And then we have medu uh, medullary and mucinous. The medullary carcinomas can be ductal and they can be lobular. They look like the color of brain tissue and that's why they have that name. So they have this color that looks like brain tissue. And then the mucinous carcinoma has a gluey-like substance oozing out of those cancer cells. Um, inflammatory cancers usually have some sort of outward appearance on the breast that it's inflamed. It might be swollen, it might be hot. It usually is one of these other kinds, but it also has this inflammatory component with it. So I just got these in my email this morning from pathologists at UCSF. About a few weeks ago, I asked my pathologist, but I didn't know that he had moved to a new uh, hospital. He moved back to New York. He checked his email at the beginning of the week, and he asked some of the current pathologists if they would pull my specimens and get, get me some um, pictures. And then this lovely woman, Julia Yi at UCSF is like, can I make you a PowerPoint that is annotated? And I'm like, please, <laughs> that'd be amazing. Um, so I did pull two pictures out of there to share with you guys tonight. I didn't want to add too much to this or I'll get off track. But these are normal breast ducts and lobules. Here's a blood vessel with no cancer in it. And this is a section that things look the way they're supposed to look, which makes me happy. Um, this is the ugly slide. Um, here, this is a duct and it's full of DCIS, that ductal carcinoma in situ. And it's here and it's here. And then this trash over here this is invasive ductal carcinoma. It's spreading out. It's out of the ducts. It's moving between cells. It's like, get out of the way. I'm coming through. And it is. It's pushy. That's what it's doing. And it will invade other tissues if it can get to a blood vessel. If it can get to my lymphatic vessels, it might go somewhere else. These suckers were cut out of me, so bye bye all right so we have our our types right now i want to talk about receptors because you hear about receptors a lot these are biomarkers they 
are proteins. If you're in physiology, you should recognize, oh no, I'm really with this pointer. Um, you should recognize something like this or at least be able to say, oh my gosh, that must be signal transduction, some sort of signal tra transduction pathway. Up here we have some receptors. Now, there are three different kinds of receptors that are super important to our study of breast cancer. Estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and the HER2 receptors. Those are the ones you hear about the most. Now, we're going to start with the estrogen ones. Estrogen receptors, if you see a positive with that, means that you have a higher expression of those, meaning that you have a lot of those estrogen receptors on the cell abnormal. Like sometimes, usually you also have estrogen receptors on cells just normally, but now they're highly expressed because this has become a cancerous cell. And it's the same with the other ones that we're going to talk about. So the estrogen ones, they can be membrane bound. And it's kind of funny that there's a membrane bound one because estrogen is hydrophobic. It passes right through the membrane. So why does it need a membrane receptor? But it's there. It's got receptors that are in the cytoplasm. It's got receptors in the nucleoplasm. And when those receptors get activated with estrogen, the hormone, um, it promotes growth through a whole cascade of different chemical reactions taking place in the cell. And it is favoring um, growth in the cell, proliferation, all its biochemistry kind of happening at a faster rate. Um, just to kind of go back to that for one second, one of the ways that we end up treating this is to get rid of the ligand. That was for the physiology folks. The ligand is the messenger, okay? Estrogen is the messenger that says, hey cell, grow, grow, grow out of control. And um, if we take the estrogen away, then we get reduced growth. So estrogen receptor posit uh, positive um, cancers, well, we can lower estrogen in the body and give less fuel to that cancer to grow. So I'm taking an aromatase inhibitor, which is a drug, that it takes the precursor molecules that are gonna become estrogen and it basically blocks the pathway or the enzyme and now those precursor molecules never get to become estrogen. So it lowers the amount of estrogen. Um, so you lower the estrogen, you lower the growth rate in these cells. The next receptor is the progesterone receptor and Currently, we don't have as many treatments for this. There were a couple drugs that they used in the past. They're not using um, currently. This pathway, this, this receptor, does some crazy things. Sometimes it modulates the estrogen receptor. It'll bind to it and keep it from meeting up with estrogen, and so now you don't get as much response in the cell. So it does that, but then sometimes it does, um, it will sometimes um, favor pro proliferation. So it depends on a whole bunch of different biochemical things that are going on in the cell. Our next one is the HER2 receptor. This is the one you hear about on the news a lot, like, oh, you can take this drug if you're HER2 positive or HER2 negative. You have to be older and be like watching CNN in the afternoon. You kids with the phones, you probably wouldn't see these commercials. Um, but <laughs> biomarkers, the HER2, it's a family of human epithelial receptors, one through four. They're important to reproducing skin cells and epithelial tissues. Their expression is normal their expression in a lot of cancers is abnormal because they get overly expressed. Mutations take place in the cell and it causes the cell to make tons of HER2 or tons of estrogen receptors. 
And so this is a protein kinase. Basically, it drives a chemical reaction that's happening right here. And you know what? Physiology people, I love to hear this. You, say, you get a response in the cell. I don't have any physiology students right now, but I always make them say that over and over again. You get a response in the cell. Well, with HER2, you get invasion. Remember, cancer cells moving in. Um, cell cycle pro um, progression. Glucose metabolism, more protein um, synthesis. And so this one is a little bit tough. And for a while, we didn't have anything that was actionable for this particular receptor. They're now using a drug called Herceptin, which is a biologic that basically inactivates it to a certain degree and slows its activity down. All right, so now we know about the types. We know about the biomarkers. The next number they give you in your first pathology report is the KI67. Wikipedia, this one, when you go home tonight, because it's fascinating. It really is. It's a protein. It's a perichromosomal protein that acts as a surfactant on chromosomes. And it keeps the chromosomes from aggregating, and it makes them slide past one another more smoothly. And so they can get through mitosis lickety split. Actually, mitotic division can still happen with a low KI number um, in normal cells, which is interesting. But this just makes it go a little bit faster in cancer cells. So um, we got 10% staining. So where we see brown, that is the presence of KI67. And what they do is they stain these cells, and they look for more concentration of that stain appearing in these um, photomicrographs. So 10% or less, doctors like that. They like this one. They don't like these ones as much. That means that there's a greater proliferation rate when we have B and C. Um, UCSF, they're kind of crazy. They're like, we like you to be below 5% with that one, that staining. I was at 8%. So they were kind of like, well, OK, you're under the national 10. So we're going to follow that protocol with your particular cancer. But if you have time to Google that later and study it more, it's really fascinating. Um, who's here from my Bio 111 class? I made you guys do a discussion on Henrietta Lacks a couple weeks ago. Um, Henrietta Lacks, the HeLa cells, they are not breast cancer cells. They are cervical cells that were made into an immortal cell line of cells. Um, and we've been using them for 70 years. And they've been the workhorse of how we can make vaccines and testing different kinds of drugs. And this is just a picture where you can see KI67 expression it with a fluorescent dye that they're using. All right, so we know about that. The next thing they come and say, hey, we would like to do a genetic test of um, a you, and we want to look for some different genes. And the genes that they're really looking for are the human breast and ovarian cancer genes. These are the BRCA1 and 2 genes. They greatly reduce, um, um, increase risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So I went back to UCSF and I gave a vial of blood that went out to a company named Invite. And you know, for years, I'd had Sarah wanting me to do my genetics, the 23andMe. I did my dad's. I th kind of felt like I was cheating. I could see his genetics on 23andMe. I'm like, I know half the story. <laughs> but now I had to learn the whole story. So um, I had that test done. And after I did do my 23, I was 3andMe. I was like, what the heck? With the cats out of the bag. So. I got this report back, when was this? August 8th. This is like moving at a pretty quick clip. And this is the panel. And they said, you are negative for BRCA1 and BRCA2. 
I was really excited about that. Um, if having those genes, if I was going to pass them on, I might have passed them on to my two daughters. So I was really relieved to not have those two present um, and to kind of move on from that. So the, the next part of the test, and I just included this in fun because for fun, you know, if you ever get a genetic test done, don't freak out. In that report, it said, hey, you got some variants of uncertain significance. And I was like, oh, what's that? That's crazy. Um, and it's on the Dicer 1 gene and the NBN gene. And it's only one base pair difference. And it changes your amino acid in a protein. I was like, ooh. What did that do? Well, I Googled Dicer 1 and NBN because I don't know. And I was horrified. Like it, it basically, lots of developmental um, problems um, morphologically. And I was kind of thinking, I don't think I have that because my kids are OK. I'm OK. My dad was OK. My mom was. So that can't be right. So I threw this into a program called BLAST. And it's only if you're a bio person that you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take my genetics and figure it out. And I had a benign mutation that I ended up with a protein that does have a different amino acid, but it folded just well enough to still do its job. I was also kind of excited that my, pro my gene that I have is one closer to more less sophisticated mammals than humans. <laughs> and so it's something I inherited from like my chimpanzee. No, that, that's not how that works. They're like a side <laughs> branch. But some of my primate ancestors probably. And humans, we've been evolving past that moment. But mine still works OK. It probably makes me as crazy as I am right this minute. <laughs> OK. so. Um, also, just what I want to say, if you ever do get a genetic test done like that, talk to the genetic counselor. If you see the weird thing, don't Google Dicer 1. <laughs> just ask somebody to explain it to you. OK. So we find out all this biology. And, my, and it was funny. At the very beginning when I met the surgeon, she was like, we need to know more about your biology so we know how to treat your cancer. So we, we did our tests. And we found out that it was BRCA1 and 2 negative. And she was like, well, I recommend breast conservation surgery, which is a partial mastectomy followed by radiation. And me, I'm like, nope, take it all. Because I didn't know some things. I didn't understand how those tissues are um, organized. I thought there must be some little membrane and you can take all the breast tissue out like in it's like in a nice little neat bag, tie it up and throw it in the bin. I don't need it anymore. I'm not nursing anybody. It's not like that. It's not in a nice little package and breast tissue gets left behind in a mastectomy. And so there's tissue there still that could someday become traitorous in the same way. And so when you start to look at the statistics, there's little difference in risk of reoccurrence with breast conservation surgery or mastectomy. And I still didn't believe it. I was like, well, but um, how can that even work? And then it started to actually make sense over time. And the more I read and the, and the more I studied, and I kind of understood that you couldn't actually, um, if, if you had a full mastectomy, it's hard to actually scan and do mammograms and follow on. So if a cancer recurs in that tissue, you don't know until you can actually palpate it. And then depending on what kind of reconstructive surgery you have, you might not find it for a while. And so ultimately, I went to this particular treatment, but this was based on my biology and a very, very lengthy discussions between myself and my surgeon to get to this point. And so I want people to understand that there's never any 
You know, it's not all the same. What one person does, or if you think somebody should do something in their treatment, it can be different, okay? Um, I also want to mention reconstruction, because with these surgeries, if somebody has a mastectomy, they are covered under the US Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act. They are entitled to reconstructive surgery if they want it. It's not cosmetic, it's not extra, it's to make that person feel good and complete, however that is. Um, I, I was talking to Shelly, the nurse practitioner, and she said some people decide to have the tissue removed and they never reconstruct and they're comfortable with that. And that's, that's all like we're all different in how we react to this. So um, always kind of think about that. But people who want it, it's not cosmetic. Okay. So did that surgery and got a pathology report from the surgery now, and it included all of this, size, margins, differentiation, grade, and then I like grades when I do well, um, lymph nodes, um, is, are they involved? Were there small amounts of cells in those nodes, which would be micrometastases? Um, and then node involvement and location, like which nodes. So my tumor was 1.5 um, centimeters by um, 0.6 centimeters by 0.4 centimeters. And my margins were super clear. I will tell you, they did my pathology in surgery and I had asked for a centimeter all the way around, I was like, take more. I feel good about that, it makes me feel better. Now, to, like what the usual want is by the pathologist and the surgeon is that they get three millimeters. That is clear margin. And I was like, can I get more than that? And I ultimately did. Um, my surgeon, Cheryl Ewing, who's amazing, she was like, I want you to see in your report right here, I went back on this section. You had six and I took some more. And I was like, okay, <laughs> great. She knew I was a little bit nuts. Um, so margins clear, differentiation. I did not score well here. I got a three. My cells were highly undifferentiated and behaving badly. As you could imagine, they would be. <laughs> They're mine. Um, they were acting so badly. They were killing their sisters around them. They were using nutrients, and so I had necrosis. That's just dead material living in you. Well, not living, it's dead. Um, and then from all that information, they make a grade. And so I got like ones on some of these and a two, and then it's two, it's like out of three is your ultimate grade score. And I got a two intermediate because I had that one three. I would have had a better lower score, but that's okay because I think we got it all. And then lymph nodes, mm, no involvement for me. Also in my report they said, they saw no blood vessels with vascular invasion and no lymphatic um, vessels with um, invasion. So that was good. Now, from all that information, I know. So this is like crazy, right? Like you're having to wade through all this information to know what's happening. This is that part where they tell people what stage of cancer they have, right? And so if you guys have, so one thing I just want to mention, if you're someone who has breasts, by the way, 1% of males, 1% of, of breast cancers, um, breast cancers happen in males. If you stay after for questions, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, so this is Susan Love's breast book. If you have breasts, you should read this at some point. It's a fascinating book. Um, it's kind of referred to as the breast Bible. And you don't need to have cancer. Like the first beginning of the whole book's for everybody. Um, so my, I was here at a T1 on my size. 
and I didn't have nodes, and I didn't have metastases. And so ultimately, they take all these characteristics into play to place you somewhere on that chart, and that helps them also decide what kind of treatments, along with the biology biology, you're going to have. And so I ended up right around here. Um, my doctor was like, well, we could move you to 1B because you did have the differentiation badly behaved cells. So I'm right in there. Um, the next thing was another genetic test, I kid you not. Um, so this is called oncotyping and this happened with my oncologist and it basically tests you for these 21 different genes that in breast cancer are known to be mutated. They're known to be behaving irrationally and they look for the mutations in those particular genes to make a prediction about how your cancer is acting now and how it might mutate and act in the future and then they decide whether or not it's a benefit for you to get, or me in this case, to get chemotherapy. So from this oncotype DX, and they are throwing this into some wonderful algorithm that is sorting out all of this data and sequences. And my doctor told me when you do the test, if you score below a 26, that you don't, there's no need for chemotherapy. And I got a 20. Um, and so less than 1% um, benefit with chemotherapy. And I was told that I have a 6% chance of a distant reoccurrence risk at nine years. And I will tell you, Don will tell you, I've been walking around really pretending that that's just a local reoccurrence and not a distal reoccurrence, because I don't like that. I almost, I almost cut this out of my presentation this week. I was like, I don't want to talk about this. Have to talk about it. I got a plan ahead. And I've got to, you know, face my biology. But I started running during all this because I get stressed out. And nurse practitioner Shelley was like, hey, do you work out? And I was like, what? I almost was like, can you work out with cancer? Like, am I going to spread it around? <laughs> get that heart going? Yeah, like, yeah, let's just move it everywhere. I was like ready to just stay still f until the surgery. <laughs> And she was like, no, it, it pushes it back. It doesn't like it when you run. It doesn't like it when you create a little bit of free radicals from your workout. It actually acts a little bit like a chemotherapy. And I was like, hold my beer. Like, what? <laughs> like, I'm going to totally, like, I'm on it. Today, I ran three miles because I was nervous as heck to give this talk. And um, I, my, my time today was uh, three miles. 30 minutes and like 28 seconds. So yeah, screw you cancer. Um, 6%, my oncologist said if I keep that up, and I'm gonna talk about this more, that I can actually say that that's 3%, which I will take it. Um, radiation, that was, I'm not done, I'm so sorry. Um, Radiation, I met with Dr. Singer. Okay, this is where the physics comes back. Dr. Singer, we, you'll see her picture at the end. She's super young. She has a PhD in physics and an MD with a specialization in radiation oncology. Um, some of my questions must have seemed so stupid. Um, they use high energy beams to kill cancer cells. They are x-rays. And treatments are done over three to six weeks. There are 16 treatments. That's what I had. I had 16 treatments. I don't, other people have different numbers of treatments. Um, and mine were two to three minutes long. And here's this little table. This time I get to lay on my back like this and watch this thing rotate around my body. I didn't watch. I closed my eyes. I was like, I can't. Um, but as we were planning this, doc, um, I was like, well, what are the risks and side effects? And she was like, well, fatigue. You might have like a sunburn, 
a one in a thousand chance of getting a um, carcinoma, a, a sarcoma, a rare cancer. And I literally, with that, no, I, one in a thousand for me doesn't work. I was like, what? Um, I'm like, can I skip it? <laughs> She's like, oh, well, you can, but your recurrence rate goes from 4% back up to 25%. And I was like, let's get this scheduled. I'm all in. I'll be there. I don't want to, but we will. OK, why does this work? Just really quickly in a nutshell, remember the mitotic cycle, the cell cycle of um, our um, cells? So here we have a tumor cell in mitosis, and you hit it with radiation. Mitotic castro, ca, castro why can't I say that? Catastrophic death. Um, it is, it's that catastrophic, I can't even say it, and I'm so excited about it, because I'm like, let's kill cancer cells. Um, if the tumor cell is in the GO or the G1, um, unsuccessful DNA repair, reproductive cell death, yay. Normal cell, guess what? They get hit with some of this radiation, they make repairs, they're healthy, and usually their reproductive um, integrity is maintained and they kind of go about their business. Okay, that's true. Yeah, radiation can cause damage to normal cells and surrounding tissues. I'm still a little stiff on this side. Um, but all in all, it's not a terrible process. I went in the first day and she was like, hey, we got music for you. And I'm like, I like music. And I was in a mode. I was really like angry about this. She's like, what do you want to hear? And I'm like, kiss war machine. Because <laughs> we are going to war right now. <laughs> Um, at, during all this, I just want you to know, some of the loud music coming from my bedroom, my kids were like, Mom, why is that so loud? And why, what band is that? And I'm like, I don't know, I like it. <laughs> I was like, it's great. Um, I just want to say, while I was going through radiation, this is Flint. He lives in San Bruno at my friend Annie's house. When this all started, Annie is a cancer survivor. She handed me the key to her front door and was like, you know where your bedroom is? And um, that meant the world to me. So I did kind of get a mini vacation in San Bruno, even though I was getting radiated every day. I came home on the weekends. These are my dogs. Look at them. Um, this old is the old one. She's over here just smelling stuff. But thank God for them. They kind of really kept me going, along with Dawn and my two daughters. Like, that was amazing. I don't have a lot of time. I'm almost done. I do want to talk about therapies for a minute. These are diverse. They are complex. They depend on the patient's biology. And they have to take all of these different characteristics into consideration, the overall health and age of the patient, to basically select from these groups of therapies. And then often, now what I ended up with is the hormone therapy. I had the aromatase inhibitor that inhibits the estrogen production. And I take that for five years. So I have a little pill every single night. It's my little therapy that I do. Um, chemotherapies, they're poisons. This is rough on people. This is a hard, this is a hard time. Um, these are poisons that inhibit mitosis, which is great, but it can inhibit, inhibit that in other functioning cells and cause a lot of, um, a lot. And I'm glad I didn't have to do that right now, and I hope I don't have to do it in the future. And I want to be there for people who have to go through that. Um, a lot of new biologic therapies. There's a drug out called Kiskali, and it's for my kind of cancer if it comes back. Although, I just heard there's a new study where they showed early stage cancer um, patients getting Kiskali along with their hormone therapy reduces the rate of reoccurrence. My oncologist and I have not had that conversation yet. It does have side effects, and so I don't know if I'd really want to do that. And then we hope in the future we get more chemotherapies that are milder, that work in the way they need to. Um, 
CRISPR-Cas9, has anybody learned about that in their classes? Can we CRISPR the crap out of this? Um, we can't, really, not yet. We hope that in the future, you would have to CRISPR all of those 21 mutated genes that I talked about. That's a lot of CRISPRing. So it would have to be a very tailored CRISPR to, a, uh, to each patient. That might happen someday. Can you guys deal with me for another couple minutes? Okay. Um, I want to mention food because if you think about food more as a preventative to cancer or how to stay healthy, this is one of the most important things you can do while you're healthy and don't have cancer. Um, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. You guys want to avoid the four horsemen of the medical apocalypse, coronary artery disease, diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's. Your plate most of the day should look like this. If it looks like a burger and fries, which is mostly beige and brown, if you leave off the lettuce and tomato, Don Allen, <laughs> um, that's a problem. Your food should look like this. Do you know? Okay, so now this is the botany part. Botany people, what's in these? Phyto. Oh, phytochemicals, thank you. Beautiful phytochemicals. And there are some phytochemicals in the brassicas, the broccoli, the cauliflower, and the cabbages, and others. Don't get me started on that. That's a whole other talk. Um, that they are currently testing as chemotherapies in the future. So eat your broccoli if you don't already. Also, by the way, and Brussels sprouts are there. That's part of that group. I reduce my rate of recurrence by another 15 to 20% in numerous studies by eating a plant-based diet. Guess what kind of diet I'm eating? Plant-based. I did have a little cheese at dinner, and I did have some cheese on nachos this week. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to be as plant-based as I can. My poor family, right after this diagnosis, I'm like, we're never eating anything from animals again. <laughs> they, my husband's like, what? And then he started, he got out the cookbook and helped. Do you guys think wine's good for you? They told you it has flavonoids. It's fabulous. It's going to stave off heart disease. No. All the data now, all the data is that alcohol is a carcinogen. It is terrible for you. It, it on its own and its little byproduct, acetaldehyde over here, damage cells. They damage your DNA. They alter and increase your hormone levels like estrogen, and they cause direct tissue damage, um, increasing the absorption of other carcinogens that might be in those tissues from other stuff you ate or from the environment. So, I, hold my beer, <laughs> not drinking it very anymore. Um, no alcohol. So this was a study, and this was rough. I mean, this is rough right here if you are in England, if you know anything about them. I'm so mean. Um, I'm Scottish, not English. So, um, so of 1,000 women um, who each drink one, no alcohol, we had 111 diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Two units a day, this goes up to 127. Five units a day, which is, I think we'd all maybe say excessive, um, you are at 143 diagnosed. So 32 extra case, um, cases of breast cancer. So I mentioned exercise, but I do want you to know that people with a history of cancer who met the national exercise guidelines have a 25% lower risk of dying from any cause, including cancer, um, in the 16 years after being diagnosed compared to people who don't exercise. This was this August, Journal of Clinical Oncology. And then the big studies, and all, all of them were out when, when I was going through treatment, multiple studies of breast cancer survivors shown that those who participate in 
intensity ex high intensity exercise 30 minutes a day, um, five to six days a week, reduce their risk of cancer returning by 55%, and 68 produced reduced chance of death from any cause, like we're gonna live forever. That's not what that means, but you're gonna have a healthier life because of that. Um, this is my team at UC, this is like, and there's other people involved here in this. There's, there are nurses, there are phlebotomists. There is Alan who works um, in the parking area who helps me change a tire. My tire went flat on the way to radiation one day. That was fun, I changed my tire after. Well, Alan and I did. After having a fight about whether or not I had a spare tire, that was pretty fun. Um, this is my team. Cheryl Ewing, oh my gosh, I could just hug her because she listened to all of my questions so much. Um, Dr. Foster was involved in my surgery. Um, Shelly, who you've heard about, organizing everything. I've got John Park as my oncologist. We still Zoom. I get to see him in person sometimes. And this guy, Christopher Schwartz. Um, he made it happen that I got um, a bunch of those pathology pictures that you guys saw tonight. And then this is super genius Lisa Singer. Um, Donald Abrams, I got to meet with him. John Park was like, hey, you should talk to Donald Abrams because he's super into exercise and food. He wrote the textbook on integrative medicine with Dr. Andrew Wheel, if you guys have ever heard of that guy. And he's kind of famous for like, hey, food is everything. And um, we had a terrific talk. He was preaching to the choir. I was like, yep, I hear you. I will do all that you say. Um, so they're passionate about their, what they do. And I just want to say, if you are a healthcare professional, do it because you really like people and really enjoy helping people because we really need you. And we need people to be supportive and we need people to explain things. So if that's your career path, be there for us, not just the paycheck, right? Like some people are like, oh, I'm gonna make a lot of money. But that and you love this kind of science stuff, you kind of want to geek out on it and you want to help people. And at the very end here, um, these are some of the women in my life who have had breast cancer or are breast cancer survivors. Um, we did lose my husband's Aunt Mary just a few months ago to breast cancer. Um, and there's some people in the room tonight on that list. Um, I will tell you I got paired up with Adra and Renee early on in my diagnosis. Adra was the mom of my daughter's best friend at UC Davis. And literally, um, Emily picked Fiona up in the car. Fiona went to visit her in Seattle. And, and Emily looked over and she goes, well, my mom's not gonna be there for a couple days because she got diagnosed with breast cancer. And Fiona thought, like, is this some sort of weird joke? Like, she's like, no, 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 my mom got, has breast cancer. And they were like, no, my mom has breast cancer. <laughs> well, both of their moms had breast cancer. Adra and I became friends and we texted each other along the way. And then Renee's my husband's cousin and we're still texting pretty often and her journey's a little longer than mine. So I am with her um, as long as I'm, we're always. And I am so appreciative that how many of you are still here and I'm gonna stop talking. That is my whole talk and thank you so much for being here.